welcome to Rising. We have a really great show for you today. I am joined at the desk by Amber Duke. Welcome, Amber. Good morning. Great to see you. It is always such a treat. Now, I say it's an especially great show today, not just because you're here and I get a little break from Robbie Swap. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> no, really, substantively, it's a great show, and I'm looking forward to getting into it. How are yeah, you feeling? I feel great, and I, I know the comment section is going wild right now. <laughs> <laughs> Too much female energy. We'll, we'll, show you, we'll show you it's a good thing. First up, all political eyes are on Wisconsin, the movement to oppose President Joe Biden at the ballot box over his handling of Israel's siege of Gaza, delivered in this state's Democratic primary election. The Associated Press reports that more than 47,000 voters on Tuesday chose, quote, uninstructed, unquote, option on their ballot to voice opposition to Biden's policies on the war in Gaza. The goal had been to garner merely 20,000 votes, so once again, uncommitted exceeded expectations and won 8.4 percent of the vote compared to Biden's 88.6 percent. And Dean Phillips, who, despite dropping out of the race, garnered 3.1 percent of the vote. This campaign to register the desire for a permanent ceasefire message at the ballot box was launched last month in Milwaukee by activists in concert with elected officials, students and NGOs. Meanwhile, a new NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll finds that Americans are turning away from Joe Biden. The majority of those surveyed say they disapprove of the job Joe Biden is doing and that they have an unfavorable opinion of him. But in the poll, more people say that they dislike Trump than Biden. Most Republicans surveyed think that America has gone so far off track that it might need a leader who is willing to break some rules. 28% say Americans might have to resort to violence to get the country back on track. While much of the media landscape has painted former President Donald Trump as a threat to democracy since the 2016 presidential election, 2024 independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says it is President Biden himself that poses the larger threat to American democracy. Let's watch what he had to say on CNN this week. The question was, who is the worst threat to democracy? And what I would say is, I, you know, I'm not going to answer that question, but I can argue that President Biden is because the First Amendment, Aaron, is the most important. So just to be clear, you're saying you could make an argument that President Biden is a worse threat to democracy than, than Donald Absolutely. Trump. Absolutely. Now, according to new ABC reporting, former Hawaii Representative Tulsi Gabbard turned down an offer from RFK Jr. to be his 2024 running mate. She said in a statement, I met with Kennedy several times, and we have become good friends. He asked if I would be his running mate. After careful consideration, I respectfully declined. Ooh, okay, a lot of big news there. Let's start just off the bat with the, um, it's not called uncommitted in this case, but we familiarly understood the movement to be this uncommitted movement where people are registering their discontent over the um, course of the Gaza war by voting for someone other than Joe Biden and voting for ostensibly a sustained or permanent ceasefire. Recall that in 2020, Biden very narrowly edged out Donald Trump in Wisconsin by about 21,000 votes. Now we're seeing 47,000 people in a primary election, which typically has much lower turnout than a general election, registering their discontent with the president, should he be worried? I, I think it's definitely significant, um, and not only in Wisconsin, but Michigan as well. We saw a similar breakdown where Biden won the state by just a couple of points and a few, uh, you know, few enough votes that uncommitted very well if, if they don't all go back to him in November could cost him the election. I mean, and, like the election, not just in these states, right. right? Because these are key swing states. He really has to win these in order to be reelected. And then, I mean, even outside of the swing states in Rhode Island, uncommitted got 14.9 percent. That's right. In Connecticut, 11.5 percent. Now, I don't think anyone believes that those states are going to break for Trump. But if this is a movement that continues to pick up steam and spreads across the country, I, I think they have a serious problem here. Yeah, and that was even before uh, some of the more difficult aspects of the recent news cycle emerged. And as I think I mentioned in the radar a couple of weeks ago, when we're talking about the death toll and the imagery that has affected people so much, we're expected to see if things continue. 
it basically doubling by the time the election season rolls around. And even if we do get a permanent ceasefire tomorrow, we're still expected to see the consequences of the famine really ratchet those numbers up in a way that I can't help but think is going to really damn uh, Biden the closer we get to the election season. I wonder what you make of some of these polls about the comparative likability, favorability of Joe Biden uh, versus Donald Trump. Do you find any of that to be surprising? I think at this point, the unfavorability for both of them is kind of baked in, and people are beyond deciding hmm. based on that, right? I mean, we've come a long way from the test of someone uh, will be more likely to be president if the American people are more likely to say that they would have a beer with them. Mm -hmm. I think we're so far beyond that at this point that no one even expects that the candidates are going to be likable. And so we're talking about completely different calculations for who people are voting for. I do think, you know, going back to the uncommitted just for a moment, that if Trump were smart and his campaign were smart, they would absolutely try to capitalize on this fissure in the Democratic Party. I mean, Biden right now is running ads in Michigan on abortion. Trump should be running ads about his position on Israel. Um, and he's come out and said recently in interviews that he thinks that essentially Israel's losing the PR war, that they need to wrap it up, and kind of signaled that he's not going to be the sort of rubber stamp on pro-Israel policy that he was. In his first term. Yeah, I think the problem with that is that, in all likelihood, based on his behavior in his first term, he will give the rubber stamp. I think what Donald Trump has that Joe Biden doesn't isn't a substantive policy difference, but a lot more savviness about which way the wind is blowing. So there was some reporting we might have talked about it earlier this week uh, about how uh, Biden, uh, sorry, Trump had plans to run ads just highlighting Biden's perspective on Gaza as opposed to articulating his own perspective, um, kind of a my enemy's enemy is my friend kind of a deal. And I do think that would be an incredibly savvy move. The only way for Democrats to avoid criticism that's implicit in one of those kinds of ads is to actually change policy. Whether or not that's likely to happen is a whole other story. I also want to ask you about this RFK Jr. news. Now, there was some significant pushback, it seemed, from RFK Jr.'s base about the selection of this vice president who uh, vice president, uh, presidential candidate who had recently uh, given money to um, uh, Joe Biden in 2020, who was the ex-wife of the founder of Google and all of the associations with big tech that are very negative in that kind of political space that RFK Jr. is occupying, discovering that apparently he had solicited uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who really does seem to be sort of in the same independent media space, moving from the left to the right, that he is occupying, or at least from the left to the center, that he is occupying, seems like a good pick. What do you make of her choice not to want to be on his ticket? So there's an interesting dynamic here, because there have been whispers that she might be considered for Trump's VP. Mm. And so she might be sort of holding out for a better offer. Mm. And that might have been why she turned it down. Because on paper, you're right, they seem like perfect bedfellows, right? They sort of have this left-right populist crossover. They're in the independent media space. They have sort of rejected the party structure that they were previously into and have branched out on their own. But I think maybe she's kind of hoping that she'll get the, the Trump pick. So is that a smart choice for her to hold out, though? How likely do you think it is that Trump would actually pick Tulsi Gabbard as his running mate? So I would say the top three choices right now for Trump are Tim Scott, J.D. Mm. Vance, and Tulsi Gabbard. Really? Those are the three that I've been hearing. Um, people have been pushing really hard for J.D. Vance in the past couple of weeks, which there was so much chatter on Twitter about it from conservatives that it seemed coordinated. Mm. And so there might be some kind of push maybe by his team or people close to him who are trying to sort of gin up chatter about it so that Trump does pick him. But look, he's got a lot of qualities that someone would want in a vice presidential candidate. He um, didn't really come from a traditional Republican space. He obviously came to prominence with his book, Hillbilly Elegy. He represents Ohio, which is, you know, a Midwest sort of swing state that Trump obviously would want to boost in. Um, but according to a lot of people who have talked to Trump about what he wants in a vice presidential pick, he's not as interested as he was last time around as sort of boosting his streak cred with the conservative mm -hmm. base. People know who he is now. He's known quantity. He doesn't need a Mike Pence to you know, prove that he can win evangelicals or what have you. And his main calculation right now is, do I think they could be president and do I like them personally? Yeah, it does seem to me that J.D. Vance doesn't bring a lot to the table that Donald Trump doesn't already have, and that he does also bring some 
baggage. I think Trump has been smart to avoid some of the culture war stuff in recent years. Ron DeSantis leaned all the way in, and it obviously didn't help him, uh, really didn't boost him sufficiently to win the Republican primary. Tulsi Gabbard, to the extent that likability might still matter, I think does come off as a lot more approachable, a lot more human, a lot more accessible um, than some of the other characters. Tim Scott, I think, comes off perfectly fine and likable. But again, is there a real value add, or is he just a placeholder. Tulsi Gabbard, I think, is someone who could create some genuine excitement about uh, Donald Trump, especially among those who are weighing whether or not, as, as people who are kind of oppositional to the establishment, they want to go all the way to an RFK Jr. figure or kind of stay a little closer to home with a more likely to win candidate and not have to kind of throw away their vote on an RFK Jr. If Tulsi Gabbard's right there kind of giving Donald Trump the imprimatur of kind of outsider um, credibility. I agree. That does, and it takes away the uh, back and forth over whether RFK would take more votes from Trump or from Biden. He now has this sort of certified Democrat billionaire, essentially, that he's chosen as his VP, which is going to presumably help him pull more votes from the left. Whereas if Trump were to pick Tulsi, he would be able to perhaps stave off some of those voters who are thinking about leaning in a little bit more towards RFK Jr. I think the other uh, the other part of the the issue with Tim Scott apparently is that Trump doesn't really like him mm. on a personal level apparently. Interesting. Um, at least that's what I've heard. So he, he might not be the guy, but um, I mean the main thing too is that. Interestingly, Trump kind of rejects the idea of picking an identity politics VP. He doesn't really want to have someone just because they're a woman or because they're black or what have you. He doesn't think that that matters. Right. But does that mean that you can't have a woman or a black person? No. Because we haven't been talking doesn't. about the race of these people at all. It's very much the substantive politics of Tulsi Gabbard that makes her uh, appealing. Now, you, you let us know what you think about what should happen here. I, for one, would very much look forward to another Tulsi Gabbard, Kamala Harris face off the way we got in the primary in 2020. Sparks flew, would like to see it again. Stick around, we've got a lot more rising coming up for you next.